Welcome everybody to another episode of Dreamer Talks. I am your host, Trevon Gross Jr. Today I am joined by the infamous artist, Uzo Njoku, uh, who's here now in the New York, Northern Jersey area. Uzo, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you for having me. For sure, of course, of course. So uh, the purpose of this show is to just basically uh, let people know how you got to where you are. You are basically living the dream. You're an artist, like I said, um, and we're just going to get to everything that you got to. But I want to start off this interview by asking you, what is your definition of success? Um, success is getting to reaching your goals and being mm-hmm. happy while doing it. Mm-hmm. So how do you, how have you found happiness in what you're doing? Like what, what is the source of happiness for you? Um, I think it's kind of just how the public receives what I create. So that's happiness for me. Mm-hmm. Um, little my, milestones I create for myself, I am reaching it. So I would say success is going to be different from different people. It can be something small, mm-hmm. like a weight loss challenge, or it mm-hmm. can be something big, like buying a new property, you know? So yeah. I believe success is going to be different for different people, but it's something that you reach or something that just makes you happy. All right. So tell me a little bit more about like your, you said that you created milestones for yourself. Like, what's that process like for you? Is that like a sit down and, you know, you write them down, milestones that you want to reach? Mm-hmm. Like, tell me a little bit about that process for you. I don't really plan as much when it comes to ideas that I have. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like if I have an idea, I'm going to start planning for it and I just go, I go at it. And I'm the kind of person that prefers to learn along the way versus sitting down and wondering what if. So as I am going in, I will start making small milestones and as I'm reaching them mm-hmm. and sometimes those goals or milestones can shift you know so that's right. I prefer dynamic goals gotcha so from, just to make sure I'm understanding you correctly it sounds like rather than you say you know you create a big milestone for yourself you'd rather just create smaller milestones reach those and then like you said they're dynamic they're always changing based on exactly what's going on exactly so tell me a little bit about just your journey of how like what milestones got you here how did they change? Like, tell me a little bit about just your journey, how you got here. So I came to University of Virginia at first to study statistics. Um, mm-hmm. I liked it, you know, but I didn't love it. And I knew that if I continued down that path, eventually I would quit. So then I took a year off and I just started painting for my dormitory, like my hostel that I was staying at. Mm-hmm. And I posted it on Facebook and people were just a little bit more supportive. They're like, oh, this is great. If you look at those paintings now, I wouldn't say they're great, but <laughs> right. I appreciated right. the support and the support is literally what has gotten me to where I am right now. Yeah. Um, so I come from an African family and, you know, they're very STEM based. So I knew that trying to talk them out of me doing statistics and maybe an art was going to be a challenge, mm. um, especially coming from a migrant family. I came to America when I was seven. So they do want, um, they do want that all these sacrifices are being paid off, so I understand in a way. Right. Um, so the first step was I started taking small classes. I started taking small classes at um, UVA. But I knew f- just from like my classes that if you just think that to become a big artist is just doing what you're supposed to do in class, then you shouldn't yourself in the foot. You know? right. um, a lot of kids there were doing art more as leisure, and I knew that I needed to find a way to make this a career. I'm um, down the line. I started myself reaching out to galleries, but they started saying no, and it's okay because that was kind of like brought me to the reality that I need to have bodies of works outside of school. I need to have a cohesive body of work. And so during the whole school program, I was trying to figure out what what is my style, what do I want to achieve, what do I want to express. Mm-hmm. Um, and with doing so, I need funding, need funding for equipment, um, research, things like that. And I kept applying through the school, and I kept getting denied. So, um, and then what happened, I think it was 2018, the class I came with, everyone graduated. So I was yeah. just stuck in campus. Mm-hmm. I applied for um, gallery internships, all this stuff, and I didn't get it. You know, So I started working at Boris Head Sports Club. And I just had, you know, had a summer of just working at a sports club, so I said, okay. I need to do something productive while I'm working, you know, because mm-hmm. I was behind the desk. And that's when I had the idea that, okay, I'll release a product. I'll release a coloring book, you know. And so as I started mm-hmm. thinking of the idea, I started looking up, do I want to go through the journey of looking for publishers that route, or do I want to do and, um, publish it myself independently? And so I did my research, and then I started 
I posted it. I posted it on um, Instagram. I said, guys, I'm going to publish a book and give myself a month. And every day I was putting in images and I was updating everyone on social media and everything. Right. And then I was like, okay, so how do I publish a book without money? Yeah. You know? And so yeah. that's when I went and I put the book on pre-order. And it was, I think it was in August. And then that's actually when I actually registered Uzo Art LLC, the business, because I needed... You know, to protect myself. Right, you know, yeah, I, yeah, I, don't, I didn't really too. know the 10 9, but I just needed to mm-hmm. um, protect myself. And so I put on pre order, and our first pre order, we made over a thousand pre orders. And so that wow. was like the first. I, I didn't realize so many people were paying attention or looking forward to the book. Yeah. Um, the book was basically just um, exploring femininity in all aspects. You know, there are women who are in the corporate world, women who are cooks, entertainers, women who are mothers, and that's what femininity is to them. And so that that's what that book did. It explored that and told the story as well. The school picked it up. I guess they loved students who do projects. Right, do, yeah, you know, really, and yeah. then so did the local um, news channel. So I started, I was on CBS News. Then I was on, you know, the school started doing um, interviews on me. And then I started reaching out to independent bookstores all over town to get my books in. So I started mm-hmm. learning more about creating relationships with bookstores. And then I started... Um, Reaching out to, I was like, okay, bookstores. I reached out to a few bookstores regionally, um, one in Texas, um, LA, trying to reach like a big cities, New York. Right. I was like, okay, museums sell books. They have like, you know, the little gift shops. And so yeah. I started reaching into museums. And that was kind of like my first big product. And then, I, you know, I was here, you know, I have an extra year here and I didn't want to spend my last semester here. Mm-hmm. And so I went to London and my idea was I was going to open an account over there and Establish myself internationally um, for the books I can be able to sell regionally. It didn't really go as planned because I didn't realize the coursework was going to be so much, mm-hmm. or the weather was going to be so depressing. You yeah, know? but so it was raining over there. It was so. raining. It was just depressing. So I was yeah. learning a lot about myself. Like, okay, I don't like this kind of climate to create, and yeah. you know. But that was when, when I came into London, in my head I kept saying, because I just finished my thesis show the semester before. I'm a painter. I'm a painter. I'm a painter. So I came into London. Um, University of Arts London, which is like number six in the world. I don't even know how I created that um, relationship to get in. And it was just such a different dynamic. Um, I would say American education system for art is more, you know, you come in, you take drawing, you take um, watercolors, you take you take these different classes, then you build up into oil paint. And London is different. They want you to be multidimensional. They want you to do as many mediums as you want, as long as you're approaching your thought process um, your body of work. And so I would say that when American students leave um, the undergrad system, they have body of, bodies of works, but it's more academic. It's what they've done right. for classes, yeah. but they don't have a cohesive body of work because they're busy fulfilling what their right. teachers want. Versus in London, I w- but I would say their skill set, because of they're so focused on the technicality, is more precise in America. Um, and then I would say in London, it's more, they do have cohesive bodies of works and they approach it from different ways, but when it comes to technicality, I would say that it's not it's not as adapted right. as, yeah. as, so, as so. Uh, let me ask you this because I feel like right now you've covered so much. There's you, so you learn so much about yourself yes. as an artist. You learn about yourself personally, like you said, in terms of like knowing what environments mm-hmm. you know you work best in. Tell me a little bit about just that mindset. Like, how were you feeling when, you know, like you said, you had to explain you're trying to explain to your parents, like, look, I want to do art, right? I know that you guys put in so much sacrifice for me, and you want me to do statistics. But, you know, my heart is in, is in art. That's what I'm into. And then you said you run into the obstacles of, you know, funding and things like that. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, you find all the success with the coloring books. And now, you know, you basically go from coloring books to where you're known locally, nationally. Now you're on basically an international stage, like you said, going to the number six art school in the world. Mm-hmm. Like, tell me that, like, does that, when you were, I guess, when you were at, in London, did that ever, like, do you oh, think like about that often? Surface? Yeah. Um... I would say I had to just kind of persevere because with my parents, they didn't talk to me for a while. Mm -hmm. Um, They cut me off school fees. So I remember that semester that I switched. Um, I was having a whole battle with the school trying to not get kicked out because I didn't have the funds. I didn't have the funds to pay for. I'm a hostel. I didn't have the funds to pay for anything, you know. Mm -hmm. And I did. I don't know if anyone remembered, but I did have um, a small mini show in um, Charlottesville. I did it by myself. I had a jazz band, students that did a jazz band. I had my friends come in, waiter. And I painted for that show. And I would go on foot throughout Charlottesville and hand out cards saying, hi, come, 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 come. And we did sell works. And I was able to make a little bit of money to keep me and not get me kicked out. So that was like, it was almost like, 
in that very beginning, it was I was painting, but I was also like fighting to not get kicked yeah. out. So it sounds um, like you were you were almost like painting to survive. Yeah, almost. you know, painting to survive in the beginning. Yeah. Um, or just and I was working a lot of odd jobs. Um, mm -hmm. and then what happened? I eventually couldn't afford real estate anymore, and I found a woman. I think she was ninety five, and in exchange for being a CNA for her, I got to stay in a room. Yeah. And so that's what I was doing. So I was painting, I was working, and then I was also working for her. So after I'd come back from classes, I would work from 9 p.m. till 7 a.m. Wow. Just staying up yeah. and taking care of her. So that's kind of like, there was just so much backstory with getting to where I am. And I think that's kind of made me fight harder and being able to stand up for myself. So um, when people tell me no, like someone else is going to tell me yes. You know. Yeah, so I just kind right. of have kept that mindset going um, forward. And my parents, it's like, I know that they don't want to see talking. They want to kind of see action. Mm -hmm. And so my mom started coming around when she started coloring book and was hearing about it from other people and things like that. So that's when she started, you know, kind of realizing that her faults and started to be a little bit more um, supportive and things like that. And it, it, it has been helpful because now there are other Nigerian parents or African parents who come to her with the same, their kids are creative. Should they let them continue to be creative? And she says, yes, like, you know, yeah. she's definitely done a whole 180 on the whole subject of allowing your children to do what they want to do and not stifling that um, creativity, you know, either creativity um, or athletic to, um, athletics too because yeah. African parents do have a habit of wanting their kids to be more in, um, you know, career field STEM versus yeah. when their kid is actually very good, good at sports, at they're not yeah. going to invest in that for their child. Mm -hmm. So that's like a whole topic in Right, right. To go but it sounds like even, you know, with all the things like you said to do, like you said, you were hustling, you were a CNA, you were painting, you were doing school and everything like that. That almost really shows like how much you, you love for your artistry, right? Yes. Like in a sense where it's like, I'm sure there were days where you're like, I don't feel like doing this. I'm tired. You know, with that type of schedule, that level mm -hmm. of hustle. But I think, you know, what's beautiful to hear is like that your passion to do it kind of got you through like you said like you were painting so that way you could make ends meet you were painting because it mattered to you exactly and you know to see now all of the success of it like i'm sure that's like you know is that that has me mind-blowing i can imagine yeah so, i would say um i would say things started going a little bit more well after mm -hmm. you know the coloring book mm -hmm. fiasco happened um i just feel i started to get a little bit more snubbed uh snubbed by um, the ac academics in the art department in the school. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can understand, you know, we started having more news crews coming through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, I don't think they saw value in what I did. You know, right. some but I think even that's interesting, too, because, like you said, that, you know, kids that study art, right, the, the academic side of art, that they were doing it for leisure. Mm -hmm. That even what they were learning in those classes, it wasn't necessarily going to put them on the level that you're at now. And for you to have the, the, I don't know, the, the perception to be like, okay, I got to do things outside of this classroom. I got to do things outside of art academically mm -hmm. in order for me to get to where I want to go. And I think even that ability for you to identify, you know, how you're doing art because you have a real love for it. You want to make it a career versus, you know, the people that, you know, they might be good at it, but they're doing it at a leisure. They're doing it at just, just cause. Exactly. And I think that's like a real, uh, defining characteristic and it's easy to tell people that are doing it because they truly love it versus people that are kind of doing it just because whatever at a leisure right mm -hmm. so tell me a little bit more about uh the success of things right so like when you were going through all your obstacles did you ever imagine yourself like being in the position that you are now no because um like i said back in london it kind of changed my perspective because they try to look at me just stop thinking I'm just a painter I can do anything and London had a very um concentrated amount of craftsmen so I started meeting people who are leather bags makers people that make lamps wallpaper they so many craftsmen I met a guy who made grills in the school like you know mm -hmm. you made jewelry making so I started yeah. meeting so many crafts people that screen for and I just did so much besides just drawing piece of paper or paint so that was like a very defining moment and that's when I learned how to um, start making rugs, you know, mm -hmm. and then that's when I started for the. We actually had a group show, and it was different because the group show we went into was a very crowded, rundown club, and we had to place our art within there. And right. I was so used to just creating art to put on a white wall, and so do those points. It's very important to kind of how I how I got into where I am right now. Yeah. So I came back 
hoping that I would get a fellowship again. I was snubbed and I didn't get any award. I didn't get anything. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, I guess things work itself out for a reason. So I just dropped everything and I went up to DC. I said, let me just get out of yeah. the country. Just go to DC. Right. I didn't have a plan. You know, I got an apartment. Um, I was living paycheck, paycheck to paycheck. I was um, working at Michael's and I was nannying. And because I was doing so many odd jobs, it I didn't have time to create. And then I realized mm -hmm. how important it was to be in that art community because now I didn't have a studio. Mm -hmm. And you can't paint oil. All these things I'm doing, you cannot paint in your apartment, especially right. at, um, you know, the kind of buildings I was living, living in. So mm -hmm. for a while, I wasn't creating. And I started wow. to get depressed. Um and so then I, I remember I had like six hundred fifty dollars in my account, and I saw an iPad on on um, Facebook Marketplace for like six hundred. I was like, and this woman was asking me to do a commission for her. I think for a business, a logo and everything, and she would pay me eight hundred. I was like, okay, I can make my money back. Right a little bit of my money back if I do that, you know? Right. And so I just bought the iPad, you know, and I started right. learning how to work digitally. And a lot of, um, you might meet painters, but a lot of painters don't know how to work digitally and a lot of digital artists don't know how to do paintings, you wow. know? Yeah. And so because I wasn't painting for a while, I started teaching myself how to do digital works and I would learn through Procreate on an iPad, but then I also start forcing myself to learn Photoshop, um, Adobe Photoshop and Illustrator. And how I would learn is I didn't read the dummy books. I didn't read the videos. Um, I started taking small commissions and making small money and forcing myself. It took longer, but because I was learning my style, you're going to use only specific and certain tools that make sense to you. It doesn't make right. sense trying to learn every tool if you're not going to be using half of them. You that's understand? right. So, that, so that's how I started doing small digital works um, and then just small prints and everything. Yeah. And then um, this man in London reached out and he wanted to buy um, a canvas, you know. I didn't realize that we were on two separate pages. I think he thought it was an actual painting that he was buying for six hundred, yeah. not a canvas print. You know, so he received it. He's like, "Oh, I thought this was a painting." And I was like, "How would I sell you a painting for six hundred? You know. And he started yeah. laughing, and I just kind of explained um, my situation. I don't have a studio and everything, and he worked in the oil field, but he goes to auction houses. He goes to everything. So, and he seemed to be very knowledgeable. And I we talked, and I was like, "Okay." How would you like to represent me? And so ever since then, he pulled in money and started paying for my studio. Wow. And that's what I was using. That's when now I had a studio, so I was a little bit painting more. So things were like a little bit, you know, I was creating more. Yeah. I was, But I was still kind of digital on the digital edge as well, but I was mm -hmm. still painting, but I was still working. Right. And so things really changed um, um, when COVID hit. I yes. lost both, both jobs, but I couldn't get kicked out of my apartment. You know? right. So for a week, yes, I will say I was lost. Like, what do I do? You know. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And then I got a call um, from this man who I met in Nigeria, but he lives here. You know, um, and I think I met him once in a club, and he was—he's like, I think your works can sell. You don't have to force anyone to buy it. You just have to see it. You know. Right. And I know what he was talking about. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. He. What else also happened before then? And around that period when he called. I went viral for I made a Rick and Morty meme. So how that thing was hilarious. That okay. meme was hilarious. I was just I don't even know how <laughs> it's the most random thing and it blew. And so like with the coloring book, mm -hmm. people were like, Oh, we made a coloring book. Are you still gonna start making more? I was like, No, I'm actually an artist, you know. Yeah. With the meme thing too, can you start making more memes? No, I'm actually an artist, you know. I right. actually don't do like, you know, they're trying to commission me for memes, like, that's not what I do, I actually paint, you know. Right, right, right. So I was trying to do that and he called at the right time and he was like should push out prints, you know? And so I had more time, you know, I'm not working anymore to research manufacturers to call and get samples made and everything to see what works and how to reach a niche price point that people don't have to think twice of do they want it. Yeah. So that's how we came up with the idea of twenty dollar prints. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um twenty dollar small prints. We found a manufacturer that worked for us and that's how we started. So of course I didn't believe him. So he said, Okay, I'm gonna put my money into ads for a week and we're gonna make double that. And he did, and we made triple that, wow. you know. Awesome. And so he's uh, so I put him on, and he started doing the marketing for us, and then we started expanding. And of course, I knew I didn't want to just do prints. And then during that time period it was the summer during um, Black Parade, um, Eric Garner, like you know, the yeah, Black yeah, Lives, all, Black right, Lives right, Movement, all the and, and stuff. Yeah. all of a sudden there was a sudden heavy gaze on Black artists. Um, it's nice that there was a gaze, but the truth of the moment is still artists were 
being exploited because those price points, if they, if some artists were not so eager to take it because a huge brand, like, okay, I don't want to say any brands. Okay, let's say like yeah. a huge brand, which is out. If you actually sat down and asked other white artists how much they were getting paid for the same opportunity, they were definitely getting paid a lot more, more you yeah. know? But you were getting an opportunity. It, it, you know, it was nice. And I knew that I was now getting a lot more sales that would have been normal. Mm -hmm. And so now I was thinking, how do we keep our customers? I can comfortably say that um, based on, you know, Shopify and the program we use, we have a 89% retention rate. So we That's have awesome. people that come back a lot. And so we started doing that by brand, identi brand identity. It's not just putting artwork in the mailer. It's creating the whole experience. Right. We started, we made the whole art, um, the mailer artwork too. So when you get it, you know that's Uzo art. We received yeah. that. We started doing candles, um, T-shirts, um, just exploring phone cases. Um, just now, where did, you, where did you learn all this? Like, I, no, no, I don't, sorry to cut you off. Like, where did you learn or at least... Get the idea. Yeah, get I the idea. Like, London. okay, let's start... Okay. That's when London comes in. Yeah. Because they didn't just paint. They didn't just do one thing. Mm -hmm. They were so good with trying other things out. So because of that mindset coming from London, and I remember, I just knew that I can do anything. I want to just research and figure it out. And right. Find, like, you know, it's just doing research properly. So because of that mindset of they want you to be multidisciplinary, mm -hmm. that's kind of how I started approaching things yeah. that if I want to do that, I can do it. Right. And so it sounds like at each point, you know, you receive like a bunch of no's to like that one big yes. Yes. That's, that, that's, that's the trend I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you go through where you know, you identify art as, as your passion, you hear a bunch of no's, you get that one yes with the coloring book. You hear a bunch of no's, yes, and you're in London now. Mm -hmm. And then even in London, you know, you that's success. I mean, being at the number six you know, art school in the world, I can imagine that success, right? But you still hear no's to, you know, like you said, you feel like you got snubbed in some areas. Exactly. To then you receive a yes from, uh, you the know, studio. just, yeah, the studio. Mm -hmm. Like, and you, even through COVID, like you kept moving things forward. Like you said, like, you know, you, you didn't have uh, the ability to paint and things like that when you didn't have a studio and things like that. And if you don't press, but then you kind of pivoted to, let me get into digital. Yes. And like you said, even that dynamic where, Painters aren't really good with digital, and digital people aren't good with painting. It seems like you really bridged that gap to mm -hmm. where now you're very multifaceted, and now you're kind of back with painting, and it's like, well, I can do a little bit of everything. And then, like you said, the mindset shift exactly. that London provided for you to just kind of take yourself out of that box exactly. of London. That's incredible. <laughs> like for, because like, that's not normal. I think even um, when you talked about the story with the iPad versus um, taking on that commission, that's a risk that a lot of people wouldn't take. And I think that's what more dreamers should do is take those risks because at the end of the day, I mean, even with all the work that you have been doing prior mm -hmm. with, you know, just hustling, get into it, make your ends meet, you're painting under pressure. Mm -hmm. And it seems, it sounds also that like basically you perform well under pressure. Like you said, you learn yeah, the, the photoshops and you learn all the illustrators and everything like that under pressure. Like yes. you didn't try to be like, all right, let me read a manual or nothing like that. You're mm -hmm. just like, nah, I'm just do it. Exactly. Like what is like, so... Tell me a little bit more about just that fearlessness. Like just now that you, you know, you said London gave you that, that mentality of that you can do anything. Like what other areas has that really applied to in your life in the sense of like, is it just like in, outside of your career? Um, I would say just kind of really not letting people dictate what I have to do and just kind of taking advantage of what I want to do. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say yes, it definitely has applied to my confidence and just kind of how I carry myself. I am my art. I am, like, you know, everything does go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. I'm not taking disrespect because, you know, I can't just sit down and tell someone to take what, what my worth is. You know, mm -hmm. I can do it myself. Um, so I think, I think that's pretty much it. But I wouldn't that's really, great. I haven't really separated myself from my art too much. I've just kind of been so busy that yeah. it's kind of my art is me. Right. Um, my art so you know. and obviously so let me ask you this so you said that you know you have a really good retention rate with your customers and things mm -hmm. like that and you know your customers know that's that's an uzo art piece yes right and you said that you yourself you're attached to your art what is that like now being like recognized in terms of like the celebrity i joked with you about it you're like you are a celebrity <laughs> you know you don't like but you are a celebrity um i would say most of my customers are around because even though, yes, I paint art, mm -hmm. I literally have been very transparent with my whole process. Mm -hmm. 
whenever I say I want to create, like I'm working on a coat right now, they haven't seen it from the minute I posted a sketch. They haven't seen my conversations with manufacturers, we have hitched road bumps and everything. And because I have no issue with helping like other artists being able to see so that if I do mess up, someone is seeing that. And that's the same thing happened with the prints. In the prints for a while, I was sending it in white mailers and there was nothing to um, save it from getting bent. So then we started getting a lot of customers saying, oh, the artwork was damaged. So I'm thinking, what do I do? So I taught, I went on social media, I was like, my artwork is getting damaged. What, what is, what is there to do? And then right. someone suggested cardboard, you know, cardboard, um, inserts, you yeah. know? And so that's when like, I've just kind of been very open what, what I do. And people love that, you know, people yeah. love the transparency. Um, and it's just good that, like I said, if I ever, if I go downhill, everyone knows at what point right. I went downhill yes. and what happened. It's not anything in silence and everything like that. And so I will say that, um, I guess the personality I do show um, has definitely also helped as well because sometimes I do go viral for the most random things. You just, just went you know, viral. Just, <laughs> just talking about my family, just talking yeah. about everything. Um, and it's nice because whenever I do talk to um, people in the higher up art world, they say it's nice that you have a personality. It's nice that you're a little bit more approachable. You know, mm -hmm. um, Sometimes it, get, it does get dull for them to deal with artists who are very talented, but it's very hard to have conversations with them or you know, introduce them to more bodies of people and things like that if the artist themselves is very closed off. Um, I would say what also helped me is that I would say I might be an artist, but I consider myself heavily a businesswoman at this point. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, just finding more adjectives to describe what I do in myself. Right. So tell me a little bit more about you as the businesswoman. Like you said, you're definitely, more, definitely a businesswoman. How did you learn? What were some people or things that kind of helped you navigate the business world? I was burning out, you know, um, during that summertime, I was burning out and I knew I needed help. So I put out um, a job call, you know, and I had so many applications I was doing. And it was nice that I worked so many odd jobs in college because I knew how that hiring process went and how they acted and everything. And I knew that customer service is number one. I worked in, my, I worked in Michael's, makeup stores, I worked everywhere. So I knew that no matter what happens, the customer is right, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I will say, like, a lot of people say the customer service has has been on point. We're never late with things like that. And if we are late, we follow up in a timely manner, and we've always dealt with that. So that's, like, on the business aspect. We also have, um, you know, so we started having interns. They were, um, and they were help working. And, I, like, I was still in my small apartment in um, the D.C. area. And that's when I expanded into, I think, of that July of 2020, I moved into a house and I got a house. And so that whole base, the whole basement was turned into a um, workspace. And that's how we started um, doing more and more. And so, and then we started getting collaborations as well. And I needed to make sure, I made sure that every collaboration I did my best because I knew there was going to be more that could come from it. Right. We had the YSL collaboration that I reached out, which was actually pretty um, big for me because that's how we, you know, more followers came from that and more uh, people in that um, commercial industry as well. Um, and so that's happening, and then there's the fine arts world. Mm -hmm. You're wondering, do you even paint? Oh, you know? Okay. Um, collectors are reaching out that they feel that me giving prints at $20 and around that price range, I'm cheapening the potential of originals and things like that. So I said, okay. And, you know, I've had conversations with my, you know, my basically my art advisor right now. Yep. Um, he's like, okay, you have a show. I was like, I need to have a show. I guess I have to prove people wrong you know so yes i had a little snide remarks about do you even paint you know mm -hmm. are you just a digital they can start calling me a digital artist and i was like i'm actually a painter though. you know i'm not actually i'm a digital artist that's not right. I, i'm not a, under that umbrella i really don't like certain labels like that so um you know both clark reached out and they were smaller and their and their the person that worked um their intern assistant was actually went to uva and so she knew about me from one of my uh, professors um he's actually really great george sampson and I took this class the last semester of in UVA. It was actually mm -hmm. an arts administration class because I think it's important for artists to understand what's going on at the back. You know, what's what's making the art world run. And it's actually right. arts administrations, you know, standing funding and everything. You would not, your art would have no house or anything or room to grow or expand without what's going on in the background. So I took those classes and he was very helpful. He was mm -hmm. like, you know, he would also go and buy um, my coloring books for the whole class and so he oh, was dope. you know he was very and he was a very kind person and um 
you, you know, he, he made he made an impact in his own way. Mm -hmm. um, so she, they reached out. Um, I came to New York in January. Came to a little penthouse. Like, oh, lovely, you know, yeah. do you want to have a show? And I said, okay, you know, we'll have a show. Um, but they, they kept pressuring me. You know, you have to move. You have to, you have to move up. You have to move up. Because um, I plan on moving into this area in June. But it was so pressured that I just ended up just dropping everything and right. moving up here in March. Okay. Um, and so March, I really didn't have any more paintings. I only had one painting and they needed 12 paintings. And so, and the show is the beginning of May. So I literally... Oh, well, you had a month. I had a month. And, you know, I had a month and I was going at it. That's why I haven't really explored the area. I was just going, I was going at it. And because of I'm going at painting, I had to actually downscale the business. Mm -hmm. But I knew that by downscaling it, I would also, it's kind of a risk. I might downscale it and the potential of not selling any artwork. Mm -hmm. But we knew that from as I was creating, I was like, yeah. Like, I started getting the confidence in really painting again yeah. and everything. As I was, I was like, yeah. I can so it's that. almost like that iPad decision again. Exactly. Yeah, you know, I'm, I, I'm really downscaling right now. You know, I let off the market and I let off things. But luckily, every day we have in sales. Um, but that, for this first show, it happened like that. And so um, I leveraged myself and... Um, I leveraged myself in aspects to marketing and everything. So I was always marketing and things like that. So the show happened. And um, before I got there, were, things were already selling. And I, you know, I came in there and it was packed. I've never seen so many people. And people, and it was, and I had, so I had a lot of things to prove with the show. It was one that they, people were telling me that because I was selling prints, that the original would not sell. But I, so I, there was only one artwork there that I actually was already selling prints for. That was the first to sell. So yeah. that, that was the first to sell. Yeah. You know, so that was proved wrong. A lot of people there were people who have bought prints. A lot of were there from social media. The social media presence came to support. Flew from like Texas, Chicago, different parts to come into the show. We had, um, and so that, so there, there was that aspect proved them wrong. Um, people that were also buying other originals. I asked one of them. Um, she bought um this painting, Flower Man. And that show was very important because I had to prove a lot of people wrong. And then. I didn't want to say, I started like before then, as I was like building up to this show and painting, I started moving my description of myself as a digital artist as well, but also as a product designer. Because my digital art was not just staying in a digital sphere, it was moving on to products and different things. So that's how I started to describe myself. And that's how I started saying that, okay, there is no artist that is seamlessly painting and creating products in a digital sphere. So I'm going to show that, you know? And so that's what that show was to prove. And I created a silk scarf that's been selling like, like hot cake, you know? Yeah. And in one of the paintings, there was a woman laying down and she was wearing it. And I knew at that show, because I already released that scarf, people were going to be wearing that scarf at the show. So it was really like a surreal moment as well. We made, um, and the, there was this first print I made called The Neighborhood. I've been making a neighborhood series as shown here. Yeah. Um, and the first painting, um, there's a woman wearing a coat. And so, and the next painting, the and that scene was actually in DC where I was based in originally. So the next painting I did was a huge, the biggest painting at the show, and it was of Brooklyn because now I am in this area. Right. And so what I did was the woman, hold, the woman in the corner first painting, I brought her out, and she was now wearing an Uzo, like an Uzo art jacket with my prints and everything. So I yeah. brought it out to so try to play into yeah. back into it. And the painting, you um, and then I wanted to also have a comic feeling too. So in that scene. You've seen the neighborhood. You've seen a you've seen a night scene. We also expanded into one of the windows and told a story as well. So the, the public loved that. Um, we would also place little things like in one of the paintings. Um, a, in the painting there was a scene. A woman was in her house. You saw her with a painting, in the painting. But that same painting was already out. It was also yeah. one of the paintings on the wall. So you really integrated like everything. And I really integrated everything. Um. I made wallpaper, and in the wall, and that wallpaper I created, I put on the wall as an installation. Where I also painted on a painting, and yeah. the girl in there was wearing a UVA T-shirt, but she was also sitting on a, she was also sitting next to a, a armchair, which I also made as well. Yeah. And she was on the rug, so everything that she was surrounding herself with was also brought out in real life. So that wow. whole, and so that show, and because that now I would say I am financially stable. I don't have to stick to one style. I don't, if it doesn't sell, okay, you know, right. the business is doing good, I'm comfortable. And so because of that, it allows me to explore so many different styles that low key, it does come together because of how I pick my colors and things like that. Mm -hmm. So it, it does allow breath and eye movement and everything. So that's, and also how I place the show and everything. I wanted that 
let a random bystander walk by and look at it because especially since I put the insulation all the way into the back, but then in the beginning I had the coat mannequin. Mm -hmm. What is going on in there? Right, what's going on? And yeah. so because of that, we had people like the um, CEO of, um, the former CEO of Southern Beast stop and, and so many opportunities have been coming in just from that show. Mm -hmm. Daily people stopped and so many people stopped in from that show. So that show was really um, a, like a huge moment for me. And so that happened. I'm exhausted. <laughs> and then Dubai comes again. It's right. Just, don't forget about us. And so the show, and because the show did so well, they asked me to extend for another month. So that happened, and another month is expedited in New York. But Dubai's reached now saying, guy, hey. Right, need, what's up with need, us? We need paintings for you too, you know. Um, so then I had to push out another 12 paintings, which I just mm -hmm. finished. So I literally haven't read, and, and, and to tell an artist to paint 12 paintings in almost a, in a month is insane. It's, yeah. it's absolutely insane, you know. So I have been killing myself, but I will say that, and in that time, I've also had people reaching out. I've had um, Starbucks reached out. I've had candle companies that, you know, they want to work together, but I'm so deep right. into yeah, painting. Into so right yeah. I do know those opportunities are there because how I would speak is I would present myself that not right now. Right. Yeah. Reach, yeah. Reach I said that you, I'm sure you've really learned how to manage exactly. so much. Like and I'm I sure have, you manage your time extremely well. Exactly. And I have, um, you know, I have uh, an employee now, employees now that are still coming and helping me and now I have the funds to like, you know, every like people or not people are now working for me and we're now really expanding into um clothing because it did so well. It was like, so when is this jacket coming out? And yeah, I was like, yeah. I might as well the jacket's very nice. I'm, too, thank you. I might as well do a whole brand. And so um the Dubai show, we're done, you know. Mm -hmm. I somehow managed to squeeze in Tommy Hilfiger reached out for a mural. I don't know how I did it, but <laughs> But it got done. I got done, you gotcha. know. So then at the same time like I think a few days ago, I released the Tommy Hilfiger mural, which is in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. um, and then the show is now up and running. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's kind of where I am right now. Right now, clothing, it's expensive. Yeah. I'm pulling all my money. I'm getting in loans. And now we're about to do... Um, I'm trying to really sh prove a point now in clothing as well. Mm -hmm. um, I'm creating patterns. I'm creating my patterns. But I want to kind of show an experience, especially proving being able to create a product but you also seen that product in the painting yep. so we're having a pop-up shop in dc i'm going back to originally where i started that's dope. um you know and which is really great because so many uva uh, mm -hmm. professors saying yes yeah, they, that, can, that they, they can come to dc they mm -hmm. can everyone can make it to dc um and so we are um in the show i'm creating big paintings with models wearing the coats right. and then you're gonna like you know it's gonna, almost gonna be a whole experience as well so i have so many plans and originally i came here to actually do my master's program i actually came here for two years but you know, I'm having issues. Yeah, but I say when things are moving the way they're moving, yeah, things are moving it's the tough. Way. So I guess I'm not doing right. school right now. That's real. That's doing real. the business, and that's kind of where I am, and I love what I do. So yeah. That's awesome. That's amazing. So the, the last question I have for you, uh, Craft Your Dream, we have three core values. We have clear vision, 100% effort, and consistency. We believe these three, these three things are essential for anyone to accomplish any dream and goal that they have. What are Uzo's core values? What are, what are like three core values for you that has gotten you to this point? Research. Okay. Not just vaguely. You believing that all you have to do is just talk to the right person for research is very lazy. Mm -hmm. um, like, you know how people say, sometimes they're rude away, Google. Google is really your best friend, but it's it's how you utilize Google. You have to know what answers, what questions are you asking yourself. If you know how to form the right questions, you will find manufacturers. You will find what you're looking for, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so, research. Um, kind of just going at it, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, you don't know what would happen until you fail. Mm. You you don't know, you know. You can't sit around and wonder what if, you know. Yes. And then also having the idea that things can always be improved. You know, that's how people like Blockbuster are out of business. You know, just right. kind of kept the one same model. Always be open to improvement. Always be open to feedback. And mm. uh, and right now, people asking, "Oh, your paintings are so great. This is it." I was like. I don't know. You know, I don't know if this is it. You know, I'm always open to, um, you know, improving, changing my style. Anything could happen, you know. And once right. you have that mindset, you can literally do anything. That's beautiful. That's awesome. Well, Uzo, this has been amazing. Um, congratulations on just all the cool things that you're doing. Um, Thank you. Because this is incredible. Absolutely incredible. I mean, during our time at UVA, I saw a little bit of how everything is. To see you here is absolutely unbelievable. Thank so you. congratulations Thank for real. Thank you for having but, guys, that is a wrap. We'll see you guys on the next episode, uh, 10 Craft Your Dream events, and we look forward to seeing you on the next one.
Peace. Love for my love for my.